Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day one of the USAS R Basics. Today, we're going to be recording this and we'll be going through the, um, we're going to be starting with the home core and transaction menus within the applications. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask or send us a chat. We'll take a break around 10.15, so if I miss it, just let me know. All right. I'm going to start on the wiki. So you guys signed up under the meetings and trainings page under this link. Under the training materials, you can find the um, overview of the beginning training, which includes the PowerPoint, the agenda that we were just looking at, the PowerPoint that I'm not going to be really, I'll be following it, but I'll be more in the application showing you what's on the PowerPoint. And then we put the link to the manual and the appendix, which you can find frequently asked questions and the post and pre-migration steps and error messages, that's a good one. So we'll look at that as well. And then we'll have the recording kind of split out too by the um, topics that we'll be covering. Okay, let's go into the application. So when you log in, this is what you're going to see. Now, the menu options that are across the top here are going to be depend upon the user's access. I have admin access so that I'd be able to show you all the menu options that are available. So keep that in mind, not so a, like a read only um, user might not see all these menu options that we'll be going through on this training. So this is called the home page, and across the top you'll see the menu options. We're going to be going through all these options under the core, all these options under the transactions, and then later this week we'll be covering those. So looking at the home page, this is where you see all your reports that you as a user has access to. You can also only show your favorites, which later this week will show you how you can mark those so that they are, actually I'll show you. You check mark them so that they're favorites so that they appear on your home. So this one's check mark as a favorite in the column. So the budget activity, uh, budget account activity report would be my favorite because I use it every day and that would be the one of the reasons why you would um, flag it as a favorite. But you also have this button that you can see all. So you can access reports from the home button or the menu. Also on the home page, you can see that the application name is here. The name of the school, which my purpose is the Cotton Demo Schools, and the name of the user, which in my case is admin. In the top right corner, you can see the current posting period. Right now I'm in March 2022, and we'll talk more about posting periods later today. But keep in mind that since it's March, and I can see that it's March. Your month to date totals on accounts and reports will be March. So that makes sense. Um, let's see. Let me show you the home page of if you we redesign has the capability now of having workflow approval for requisitions. So when they log into the homepage of the 
their instance, this is what it's going to look like. On the right side, they're going to be like tasks for Fran to um, do. So all the tasks will be on the right. And again, the reports will be on the left. I just wanted to show you that so you'd be aware of what it looks like. So then they can just go in and approve that. But that's um, another training. I just wanted to show you what their home screen with the requisition approval module activated would look like. All right, so another thing on this home page is <clears throat> this plus sign, which if you click it, it'll give you the application health. And in this case, it says it's okay, which is a good thing. Um, if it's not okay, for example, you might get a warning that there was a problem during the post import process. Um, maybe all the jobs didn't complete successfully. Um, might give you a warning that an application restart is needed. But that's something that you don't often look at, but it's there to ensure that it's okay. Another thing is this help uh, menu option. And underneath we have three menu options, one of them being the about. Here you can see the version um, of the application, which if you remember, the release notes are gonna be corresponding to this. So the last release was 8.42, sorry about that. Also on this page at the bottom, if SSDT team asks you guys to send us a server log, you can simply click that button and it'll be sent to us for um, investigation or whatever is needed for the reason why we requested it. Another thing under the help menu is the documentation. I'm going to click on that and you can see it takes you right to the user guide. So you can go through the wiki to get to here or every user is gonna see this, no matter what their access is, they'll be able to click on help, see the documentation and go to it. So it takes you to here and you can see that there's a couple other topics here that we're gonna be demonstrating. But you can see the main manual is divided into your menu options like core and transaction menu is what we're covering. But if you remember, there's budgeting, periodic, and report. So there's budgeting, periodic, periodic, and report. So when you click on those, you also see the other menu options. So under the core menu options, which we're going to go through in a moment, you'll see accounts, bank accounts, delivery option, or delivery addresses and so on. Um, I referred to the appendix earlier and let me show you that. There's common checklists, general procedures. Let me show you the checklist, month end fiscal calendar. General procedures. Um, like receipt and refund processing, transfers and advances. Report procedures, useful. There's the frequently asked questions. And again, we put it in the topics of like the transaction menus. So requisitions, <clears throat> excuse me, purchase orders, um, questions about AP invoices. So for example, how is a, an account considered deletable? So you can go there if you have a question or the user has a question, because again, this is available for all users, no matter what their access is. And then um, there are some error messages that we tried to document out here. Um, 
that may be helpful to determine what the user or why the user is getting a certain um, error messages when they're trying to enter a requisition, for example, or a purchase order. So again, they're categorized. So that's the documentation. Another link is the public use ask reports library. These are shared reports that have been written and shared for anyone's use across the state of Ohio. There's also the USPS side, but we're on the USAS. These are categorized um, as account-based reports, Sorry. budgeting reports, transaction-based reports. There's vendor and periodic as well down here. So if you find one that you like, or in order to find one that you'd like, sorry for the scroll, you simply click in the example column to see if that report is something that you would like. Do I like that one? Do I possibly like this one? So it not only gives you the example and the description of what the report is about <clears throat> under these categories, like account-based reports, but it also has what they call the JSON file that you download to your computer and then import it into this application for redesign which again, we're gonna show you either on day two or day three and how to do that. So I would look here. I mean, there's a lot of reports here um, that is useful. There's PO by date. So everything is available in the system like normal reports, but these are more customized and we just put it out there for to be shared with um, the public users for redesign use as. All right, so before we go to the core menu, are there any questions? Okay. So here's the home menu. This is the core menu. And the first thing we see is accounts. Um, the core menu, if you look at these options, is pretty much like a maintenance or a setup type of options. You're gonna set up your accounts, you're gonna set up your bank account, your OPUs, your vendors. So it's like a maintenance screen. Um, which for accounts, which we're gonna go cover first, the maintenance screen in classic was called the account screen or in USAS web, it was just under accounts. You can see all the types of accounts on one screen across the top. They're tabs, so you can just click it to see the cash, cash accounts. But you see you have fund, cash, appropriation, expenditure, and revenue. They're grid style, and you can drag them, the columns closer. You can rearrange them to put the start date somewhere else. And this is um, something throughout the application that can be done by any user on grids. Um, so starting with the icons, just to give you an overview, you can hover over these little icons to give you the little tool tips. But throughout this application, you're gonna see an eyeball to represent the view. You're gonna see a piece of paper with a pencil to represent the editing ability and the 
delete button with a big black or white X. So you can also sort by, say you wanna look at the cafeteria one, which is 006. You can simply mark that in there or enter it in there. Um, you can, trying to get another good example. In parentheses, say you know there's an account, but you can't remember it, that has uniform in it. So if you put that around the parentheses, it pulls up. Um, an account with the uniform, whether it's in the first place or if it was school supplies uniform, it would still pull it up. So the parentheses is a tip to like search for that word, which sometimes is helpful like on the vendor grid. You can also use another like greater than or less than zero. So anything less than zero, there are no accounts. That's good. Anything greater than zero. So there's all kinds of tool tips that you can use on these grids. And you notice that that little blue line's going across slowly. Here's a tool tip. See these columns? They're like calculating the fund balance every time you refresh the page. So is the encumbrance. It's calculating that encumbrance. If your grid is going too slow, um, and we'll discuss this more button in a minute, but under the more button, you can pull in these columns on your grid um, or uncheck it like the encumbrance. And the reason why you would want to do that is to minimize the amount of calculating fields if your um, grid is running slow. So I'm going to uncheck this encumbrance field, and it should kind of speed up a little bit because now we only have one calculating um, column. All right, I am going to go into... 001, which is the general fund. I'm going to edit it just so it's darker. There's another tip in the application, which I like. So I'm always multitasking. You can move these little pop ups out of the way. So I got an email or something, I can go to another tab just by simply dragging this box. All right, so we have the code, the gray boxes are boxes that you can't edit. You can edit the description. Um, here you have the option to include into the appropriation resolution. If you don't want it included, you would simply uncheck it. And then when it saves, it will be saved as that. Um, and when you're including it in the resolution, these are the levels that you can customize and simply by unchecking or checking. So one treasurer is going to have possibly different app or one district is going to have one setup possibly and another district may have um, these two unchecked and that's just their preference. So it's customizable for each district and that's what's Nice. For um, certificate reporting, you can use this drop down to sort by fund or fund special cost center. So that's another um, customizing tool that users or districts can use. When you're now, we're on the fund tab. So there's only one fund for each fund. Underneath the fund, you would have different cash accounts, which we'll look in a minute. But like 
Um, sometimes you have an 001 with a special cost center of 9922. So the fund is going to roll up those 001s with the special costs up into 001. So all the 001 funds will roll up into this and give you the total or the beginning balance for all of 001 general fund accounts. Same with receipts, the fund balance, and the remaining balance. Um, you can see what's encumbered. If you're working ahead, it's March, 2022, and um, users are starting to encumber or enter purchase orders for the next month, like April, you could possibly see this populated. That's what future encumbered would be. So again, that is the fund. The next tab is the cash. And you can see right here, there are multiple 001 funds. So again, all these 001 funds are gonna roll into the fund tab and give you the totals for all of them. So again, you can drag and sort. I wanna see the fund balance in the first and then initial cash. Um, when you click on the top line, sometimes it has that arrow and it will resort. It's probably more helpful if you were on this grid and you wanted to sort like by description. All right, so. I mentioned the more button earlier, so let's go under there. All these little carrots can open up. So right now on our grid, we can see the fund, special cost, the description, start and stop dates. I am going to undo the initial cash, make the grid a little bit faster. And once I close this, the grid will refresh. Besides doing that, another thing you can do is if you have like four calculating columns and you realize that it's taken too much, you can use this reset button. It'll go back to like the, um, the normal grid. So you see this report button and whatever's on your grid is available for printing with this report button. I might not want um, these zero accounts. Or in this case, I might want to know which balances are um, in the negative. So I have no zero amounts. I click the report button. I do have options on how I want to print this. I'm just gonna go with the default that I thought I'd show you. I like always having the report options. That's probably helpful, helpful for us to help you click on tickets or helpful to you help in the district so that you know what options. It's like that first page on the report. So this report's gonna give me what was on that grid. This is the report page. 
so I can see what parameters I chose for this report. So now I have that grid report with the fund balance start and stop dates, if there are any in every fund. That report button is on, I believe every grid, so. And I will show you, um, I've given you some tips like this on how to narrow down the information that's on the grid, but there's also an advanced query to further sort down to get what you're looking for. So for example, um, lost myself in my notes, just a moment. I am Okay, I was just going to mention that advanced query. I think I do have an example later on um, to show you how to do that. But I'm going to take a look at this cash account. This is the special ed grant. I just um, edit it to make it darker for you guys to see. And I went into the wrong account. That is one of the errors that you could look up into like the appendix to see what it means if it doesn't give you anything. And actually I should have um, Okay. I wanted to go into 9922. So you have these buttons up on top, edit. You can clone this um, cash account. And again, we're on this tab, cash. You, so you can clone this for the 9923 for the fiscal year 23. You can make a cash adjustment. And um, we do have the ability to mass add cash accounts as well as the underlining accounts, but that option will be demonstrated um, later this week or mentioned because it's an, under another um, menu option. So looking at the cash account, you can see, I'm gonna make it darker that I can make a cash adjustment. You can see that my fund balance is negative. We'll just make, um, as of today, I have the choice of initial or adjustment. I'm gonna choose adjustment. I'm gonna put 30,000. And you can, um, this description, I believe, is um, long enough for any description that you might want to put in there. Once you save it, it saves under the, um, under here. You can also create a new one. You can also delete it. There's the button. These are just what's on the grid. So if you don't wanna see the description, for example, that you would think you'd want to. Those, this, these three little lines, that's what brought that up. So now, when, if I just logged in and came to this, if I went um, into this, I would still see it. So it saves it. So, On the cash account, you can also modify the description. So say I want to put the fiscal year special ed part B grants. 
you have the ability to choose what fund type it is. For this case, it's that special revenue from um, grant sources. You can enter a start date. This is typically oops, um, beginning of the fiscal year, which is 21. Now I can enter it without uh, slashes. And when I tab over, it puts it in. Again, I tabbed with my tab key, but I also can point with the mouse. I can also use this calendar and choose if I wanted that date. And I'm going to, oh, and then these are typical. I'm going to choose September 30th because that is the length of time that you can spend um, these funds. So you have other options here, active. Of course, you want this active if it's for fiscal year 22. To make it any account inactive, you would just simply uncheck it and save. Um, you can require budgeting or not. Um, for grants, it's probably best to require budgeting, but again, that's district specific and customizable. When it is checked, um, it requires the balance checking on the associated budget and appropriation accounts. So a requisition will not be posted if it causes the appropriation or budget accounts to go negative. If it is um, unchecked, it enables the users who otherwise are unable to exceed those appropriated or budget amounts to exceed those balances for this particular fund only. And then include as general. That means whether it's, um, uh, if it's gonna, if the cash account is part of like the five-year forecast, the general fund accounts. Since this is a um, special ed IDEA grant, it's not part of the general, so it's left unchecked. Include in certificate reporting. That's just a simple yes or no by check or no check. You can see that the funds totals are represented here. And again, these totals, <clears throat> are as of the current posting period, which is reflected up here. So these totals are as of today. <clears throat> um, also like the fund balance, or encumbered, <clears throat> if you recall, like the fund balance is on the grid. It's also on the account. It's also like a report option that you can pull into the report or include it on the report's parameters. So they all kind of um, in, intermingle and um, represent the same thing. Also, you'll see this throughout the system too when you're creating. Um, I think this was the only option I changed. So I, when I go to save it, I can either create another cash account by clicking here. And when I do that, it takes me right to another blank screen. So boom, I can enter, keep on entering as I go. If I want to just close upon saving, then I would um, hit that. Let me go into a real live one, though. I don't want to create new. The only difference is if 
if I just, if I don't do any of these boxes and I click save, I'm going to have to hit this bot, this X to close this pop up. By clicking on close and then clicking on save, it makes the pop up go away. You're back at your grid. So that's the difference if that made sense. And if it doesn't, please let me know. All right. So the next tab we're going to look at is the appropriation accounts. These are the expenditure accounts that are used when the school district is audited. And it's used to like track the estimated and the actual expenses incurred by the school district. So depending on users access, they may or may not be able to um, create this kind of account. But again, there's that create button that you see throughout the system. And I'm gonna go ahead. You can see that the grid buttons are all familiar, all the same. I wanted to point that out. Nothing really changed except for what is chosen under your more button which are a lot of calculating figures, but um, I'm gonna click create. We're gonna create an appropriation account. This is why you would remove some of those calculating columns if you're in a hurry. All right, so this is what the screen comes in. I'm not gonna create a new one. I'm just gonna close this upon saving it. And the appropriation fund that I wanna um, create is in regards to that special ed supplies for this fiscal year. I name, I put the description in as I, want any description. Um, if you don't upon save, it'll um, populate, I believe what's on the cash account or the fund account, one of those two. You have a start date. And again, you have that calendar. You can click here and there with the mouse, which I'm doing now, or you can enter it without slashes and you can also tab and it'll put the slashes in. I don't often use the slashes or dashes. So I'm thankful that the system's smart enough to enter those when needed. All right, so when the start date is entered, the appropriation account that we're on and the underlying expenditure accounts will become effective on that date. So as of July 1st, that's when these funds will be available to be seen by the user, like when they're entering um, transactions. The stop date is when the fund will no longer show and will no longer allow the user to see this account in order, so it won't allow you to process anything against the account. Um, oops, am I meant to put 9.30? So on October 1st, if I go to enter a requisition or a purchase order against this account, it'll give me a warning. Um, which also brings me to a tip that if one of your users is saying that the account's not showing up when the user is entering a transaction, I would come and check to see it first if it's active or if it's beyond the stop date. Because sometimes it is, and that's an easy fix. So, 
got that set up. I'm going to click to close upon saving. And let's go to the expenditure tab. I don't know if I entered this or if I was planning on creating it. So let me pull this up. All right. So I set up that appropriation account for um, supplies, but it was a different function. So again, you see these. You'll see these on purchase orders and recs too, these little buttons. The account I want to set up. And again, I'm using the tab button, but you can also use the mouse. Put my description. Actually, I'm going to leave the description and show you how it just automatically populates if you don't have anything in there. Um, it's active. We do have the capability of using um, XREF codes, which sometimes people used in Classic. Um, this would normally be a drop down if it was a 001 um, account, but a grant is not going to be on the five year forecast. So, start date and stop date is the same as like on the appropriation when you're. Um, before or after that date, you won't be able to process it. And then when I save it, my count is saved. You can see that the name populated and everything else is there. This button, edit, as you can see the tooltip. There are only um, certain fields that you're able to edit, like the name or the description of the account, the status, whether it's active or not, and the start and stop dates. You can't change any of these, not on these screens. So I'm going to close it without selecting create new or close. And then, so by doing that, I get more options. Be the same as just going directly into this. I'm oh, sorry. So now we have edit which that's what I was trying to point out. That's the same as going into here, edit. We can clone this expenditure account if we're like cloning it for next year, 9923, for example. And then we have this new budgeting tab where we can enter the budget right here. I'm gonna do an adjustment of, <clears throat> $200 of the adjustment. If I leave it July 1st, we haven't talked about this yet, but um, let me create that again. We're going to be talking about posting periods and Transactions can only be made in an open posting period. Now we're in March, so logically or possibly July is closed. The books are closed for July. So it's going to throw you that error that you just saw. So since I'm in March, 
and I'm making an adjustment. I'm just going to make it for today's date. Post or cancel, I'm going to post it. And it's going to now be on this account under this button. And you can see how that populated as my adjustment for the month for this fiscal year. And now $200 are expendable. We have nothing encumbered, so it's unencumbered. Um, again, that's what's on this grid if you wanted to change it. The error that I got in regards to um, when I had that budget adjustment dated 7-1, and I click save and I got that error. It does kind of, it does a lot of times the error does say what it's it means. So this does say unable to add the transaction in a closed posting period. Sometimes <clears throat> you need more information to determine what the this error message means. And that's what this little box is. So if we ask you we be in the SSDT support team to send us the full stat trace for the full error. What we want you to do is um, open this red box error with this, copy it all the way to the bottom and put it in a ticket. And sometimes it's not as, this is a pretty straightforward error because it says right here, you can't, add a transaction and a closed posting period. But sometimes errors are right, you know, down below. So that it's sometimes helpful for you, for us to determine why the user is getting that red box error. Okay. Um, Again, we have future year encumbrance and future year requisitions. So if you're working ahead um, and it's March, 2022 and the school districts are already preparing for fiscal year 23 and starting to enter um, future year requisitions, um, it would start uh, accumulating the total here. Once it is the current year and no longer the future period, that's when it moves up from future year encumbrance to encumbered. Um, so say I did a whole bunch of budget adjustments, not just on this account, but on many accounts. And gosh, I can't remember what I did. We have a report and we'll go over more reports in the future, but just so you know that you can get, you can get your report from this grid, but it might not be all your budgeting adjustments that you did for 001, 516, 018 account. So if you go to the report menu under report manager, we have a budget transaction report that the tooltip says I can generate and download this report. It's going to pop up, show my report options. I'm going to pick for today. Um, another tooltip, which I'm gonna, I forgot to show you this. I'm gonna jump to the, the documentation. Because at the beginning of our manual, these date shortcuts, as well as some other shortcuts like keyboard, grid, date shortcuts, 
like for today, all I have to do is put a T in there. And that's what I was about to do. And I forgot that I didn't mention it here. When I first went into that report, <clears throat> it had a PD, which is period. And it's basically the first letter and the last letter of period. Same with week. First letter of is W, last letter is K. So if I enter W here, W and K, it would give me the week's budgeting transaction. So I'm just going to run that. It downloads, and here's your report, which was just the one that I did today. So that's another tool tip. I mean, there's a lot of, I tend to use FL for fiscal um, and PD for period. I did forget about the today, and that's why I purposely used it today to show you, because that's that that is handy. So I showed you that report, and we're on accounts. So the next tab, we talked about the expenditure tab, the revenue tab. Um. I'm going to pull up the 516. All right. So this is a revenue. And again, you can um, modify these calculating fields. Actually, I'm going to show you that adjustment. All right. So I pulled into my All right, so again, you can you have the ability to edit, clone, or make an a budget adjustment. I'm gonna, and only the fields that are able to edit will be. I mean, I can't do these. This is active. I'm going to put a start date. And close it. Um, on any account, even though I didn't make an adjustment, you can see your budgeting amounts have been are stored under this for these numbers on that account. So the revenue accounts, I mean, that's pretty straightforward, but I want to give you some more tips on the grid, like, so what are all my revenue accounts that might be um, like 9920, between 9920 and 9921. If I put 9920.9921, it'll sort the column with all my 9920, 9921, which then I can sort with this arrow and putting all my 20s at top and 21s at the bottom. I might want to do further down. There's my last two years of IDEA. Um, I might want only active ones. So all the way 
This grid actually is longer too. So the scroll bar in the bottom gets you to those other columns. We have an active account. Are there any um, accounts that are false? Or I mean, not active. I would put false in there. And can't think of any other tool tips greater than which you saw me use less than. All right, so this is where I was gonna um, show you the advanced query button. So to further down, further narrow down um, the grids, you can click on this advanced query. It opens it up like this. So, Let's say I originally put all five sixteens here. I still, I mean, I still have a lot of accounts. So I'm going to further it down with the advanced query. I can, uh, so I can either put it here or Um, I would choose like the fund under account and drag it over. You saw those tool tips too. The operation would be equal and I only want 516. Now it's not gonna populate right away until I hit the supply query. And then down below, your grid results will only be 516. So you can sort here. You can do the advanced query. Um, let's pull in the special cost. There's a between. I showed you how to do special cost 9920 dot dot or period period 9921 down here in the grid. But you can also do any of these operations, I'm going to choose between. Um, I'm going to do between 9,000, comma, 99118. And then when I hit apply, we're going to only have those special cost centers down below. And again, you wanted just those results, you can prepare a report from your what's on the grid. Excuse me. You can also save this query by just entering a name here, hitting save. So then tomorrow, um, I can come in here and I have this saved already. So if I load my saved query, this is what I queried yesterday, which is similar to what I just showed you, but you saw a change. Um, and all I did was put IDEA in here, save, and then this is available under the load saved. Say you don't want that anymore, this button clears it. There's this top, you can start all over. And then when you're all done, just hide advanced query controls. And it goes back to your grid. Hey, Pat, you got a question in the chat about um, looking for just one part of the description. Oh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. I'm going to search for like class and what you can do, like in the description, put those parentheses, the word class, because I'm looking for any revenue accounts with the like class fees or general class. Um, you see how it picked up classroom because it had class in there. So that's helpful. 
Oh, and here's another tip. As you click on this line, you get a quick view of the account too over on the right, which you can just click off. So all you well, all I did was click on that row, it pops up. Um, yeah, so the parentheses. Another one might be like under expenditure account, uh, maybe student. I'm going to show you that too. I don't have the description on this account, on this grid though. So the description on there. I got rid of some of that calculating um, fields, so it should go. It is, it is the um, parentheses. But you can also, I believe, no, you do need the parentheses. If it's the first word, you can see, I'll put it in more in the middle. If it's the first word and I start typing student, it comes up, but what if there's an, uh, Parentheses, student. What if students like somewhere in the name, the parentheses will pull those up like general students or students in the middle of the name or even I see software is in the middle, but yeah, it's the parentheses. Good question. That can be used almost anywhere. Um, on grids like vendors, that could be helpful under vendors. You know it's an office supply um, vendor. If you just put office or supply around parentheses, that should help. Okay, any other questions? So that's that grid. Another core menu option is bank accounts. And so the bank account menu option is a setup page that contains the information for each bank account the district uses. So these are used and chosen when processing like disbursements. So you can have more than one bank account. Um, you don't have to name these, but since these are two separate banks. Um, I chose to name them rather than just the default. Um, you have these normal icons, view, edit, delete. You can only delete if there's like no attached transactions. This is a new icon that we haven't seen yet. And if it indicates that this fifth third bank account is the default bank account. So it's gonna populate when the user goes to process a, a disbursement, it's gonna default to that. And again, we can have more than, um, we can add that to the grid too. I believe it's a true false, um, yeah, true false column. So let's open that up. I'll make it darker. So the bank account number, this is just used basically to label the bank account. So it can be a one, it could be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like this. It could be the actual bank account, but it's just, it's a label. Um, like the description, it's a label to help the user distinguish what account and say <clears throat> that 
um, this has been used since 2001, but say we're gonna switch banks and we're gonna make this, we're gonna close this bank as of um, June 30th, I would undefault that, save it, but I would have to make the other account to be default and active without the stop date, which, <coughs> excuse me, the green bar is gonna um, also indicate which one is the default bank besides going in and looking at the check mark. And we'll show, uh, when we go over disbursements, I'll show you how that is used when we go through that. All right, delivery addresses. This is another setup core menu option. And these are used when the user is entering a requisition or a purchase order. They'll be able to drop, use the drop down under the delivery address to choose these delivery addresses. I gotta take a drink to see. You notice there are no, there is no create button here anywhere on the screen. And that's because you can't create a delivery address or even edit it on the screen. This is purely like a maintenance, not a maintenance, it's, it's a holding area. These do import upon migration. The downfall is every variation of that address also imports. So upon migration, um, they're all inactivated. And you're gonna have to go in and choose the ones that you want. So for example, I had one purchase order in Classic that had the delivery option. Then these two look the same until you get to the here where the W is. Because there was a slight variation, they both saved. So upon migration or even during the year, if you want one used more than the other, like this one's the correct one, you would activate it and leave this one inactive. So now when the user goes to choose with the drop down, they would only see this to choose from and not the, the error one. So again, they're all brought in, in as inactive, and upon migration, you'll want to choose which delivery address should be available for future use on transactions. Uh, OPUs. OPUs, or operational units, is part of the account number that defines the facilities, the buildings or departments of the district, like within the um, account number, they are defined by the district, but they help the district identify the costs associated with that. So they could get like um, uh, reports just with the high school building reports or data just for the administration. Whatever these OPUs are set up, it helps the district identify the costs associated with them. So these will migrate over from Classic. And there's really, and again, by clicking on the row, you get the highlighted version of the account or the OPU. And basically, it's the OPO, the description of what the district wants the OPU to represent, and then the IRN number associated with that building. Every district should have um, an OPU as OOO that is set up 
as the central office. And that, so you can also see on this grid, it's indicated this, the Burnham building is true. But the district has all these different OPU codes. All right. We'll do one more and then we'll take a quick break at about three minutes. And then when we come back from break, um, we'll go over posting periods. So organization. This menu option is, is, is the setup um, classic um, screen where you set up the district's addresses, the various ID numbers. Um, they will be pulled in from classic from the USA con screen. It was screen number one. Um, at fiscal year end, um, some of this information was from the USAS EMSDB, where they, the user updated the central office square footage, which you see right here. They can populate it now upon migration, and then it's done for year end. Um, but it is required for financial reporting. So... Just the information of the district, EIN, the state ID, square footage, the ITC, IRN. Once saved, it's saved there for um, financial reporting periods. So if, they, if the district doesn't do it upon migration, they're going to have to do it by fiscal year in. All right. Well, let's take... A five minute break, stretch your legs, get some coffee, um, and I will come back and we'll go over the posting periods. I am going to pause this recording. All right. So let's, we've gone through, up through the organization. Now we're going to go to posting periods. And you can see that a posting period is basically a month. I'll let somebody in the waiting room. Um, so a posting period is a month within the fiscal year with, where transactions can be created or updated. You do have to create a posting period. So I am going to create August 20. First, I'm going to do the tip that I always do, because these two columns kind of confuse me side by side. So I know what fiscal year, but I like to drag that out of the way so that I'm only looking at the month and the calendar year, because I'm going to create August 2022. And I almost said that wrong to you guys because that was confusing me. So I just kind of move it. So there's a tip, like customizing my own grid. So you push the create, the dropdown is, has all the months, I'm gonna create August, calendar year 2022. If I choose current, we would have the application in the new fiscal year. August 2022. So I'm not going to do that, but I can create it ahead of time. So there's the creation. You can see that it's tracked with the date opened. There is a date close column. And I believe I pulled this in and put it right in the middle for the reopen date. So obviously I reopened um, these months not too long ago. Uh, March 7th. You can see that there's a column there for open and current and the quarter, and there's a lot more options under the more button as well. So you've seen some of these icons, but these file folders also have tooltips. If I click on this open file folder, it's going to open the month of July 2022. 
So that's going to also open up the new fiscal year. If I, I see January is still open, true. And it's also indicated because it's not, um, it's not like this one. So if I go to close January, I would click on this closed file folder, telling it that I'm done with January, I wanna close it. <clears throat> I can reopen it, but those that's what those icons mean. <clears throat> the check mark is what makes the posting period current. So right now, March is selected. You see that by it being like unlightened. You can also see that March is the current posting period because of this green line. And it's up here for all users in the upper right corner. To simply change to February current, you would just click on the check mark. And now February is indicated by the green line and up in the right hand corner. I'm going to make March current, though, for this purpose. So posting periods must be open, like February, March, April, May, and June, July is, to post a transaction to a month. But it doesn't necessarily have to be current. So looking at this grid, I should be able to enter a PO or a requisition for February because it's open. Um, it doesn't have to be current. Um, because the current month is March. So, for instance, in March, as the current period, February's interest needs to be posted um, by a receipt. And you can still post this receipt for February since the posting period is open. The current posting period, if you recall, on the accounts is what the reports and the account is gonna show uh, the figures for. So even if I made an interest receipt for February, what's gonna show on that account are March's totals. And since you can have, since you can make a period current, whether it's open or not, Here's a way to remember it, and it goes back to manual accounting, which probably none of you guys ever did, but it, it, it entailed a book. In the old days, using a piece of paper and a pencil, you had to open the book. It's the same thing as opening up the posting period to post a transaction. You had to physically open the book and write in the entry to make that transaction. So that is opening the posting period. Now, I could make a transaction in February, even though the March is current. So there's maybe a tip that might help. So when you're generating like an outstanding purchase order report for like last fiscal year, you can make June of 2021 current without opening it because I'm not making any transactions for June, 2021. I'm just gonna get the report totals for that current period, for that um, period of time using June, 2021 as the current period. All right, I thought I had a message. Okay, so let's see. So leaving these months open like February is, even though it's the middle of March, districts should be mindful of closing these posting periods after balancing because even though it's March 16th, um, a user can enter a transaction 
purchase order, a PO receipt in error when it should be in March, but they could post it in February, in which you thought you were balanced. But since they put that extra transaction, it could throw you off. Um, the delete icon can only be done if there's no transactions attached to it. And I think that's everything about posting periods. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Okay, and then we'll go to projects. So on projects, I'm gonna show you what it looked like in Classic. On, in Classic, on the accounts, um, on the cash account, you could see this period to date fields for the beginning balance, the receipts, expenditures. So in redesign, we also implemented that. That's also under the core menu. Oops, I was already there. And this can be used to view projects and project to date information like you could in Classic. Um, they could be building projects that may go on for more than fiscal year. So with this ability, you can track those costs beyond that fiscal period. So it's very helpful, it's the project. So if the project is two fiscal years, it'll keep track of those. You can also bring more information in from the grid if you needed to. Um, If I, I'm not sure if there's an athletic project already, I'm gonna search with my parentheses, not parentheses, maybe I'm the one who said that wrong, um, percentage marks. Sorry about that. I bet I did say that wrong earlier. So around percentage marks, there is no athletic project. So I'm gonna create one. And it comes up to the screen. You can name my project. I'm gonna leave that blank. Um, these, okay, so looking at this grid, this is a project and these numbers will not get populated until the start and stop date of the project is entered. So I'm gonna put 0101-2021-20. So I'm gonna make it go beyond the fiscal year. So I'm gonna go from January, 2020 to June, 2022. And you can see down here, there's no assigned account yet. So once I close it, You see, I just started typing it and it came up. Um, and again, these numbers are not populated yet because we have one more step and we have to attach the cash account. So we have a new icon and my mouse. This one, if you hover it, it's assigned the cash account. So by clicking that, if you know it, you can start typing it. But if I put it <clears throat> under, I can use the drop down. You can see there's going to be a lot. So I'm going to start typing it. And then choose the one that I want. Hit assign, and now you see that the received between these periods 
receive the ending balance. I didn't expend anything and I didn't have a beginning balance. And the cash account is assigned. <clears throat> so now if we went to view that project again, just by looking at the eyeball, <clears throat> you can see that that cash account is populated. So if you have somebody, if you have a district saying, my projects are not populating the figures, why isn't it showing? It could be either this hasn't been assigned and reflected down on the account or the start date, stop and start dates. Because once this is assigned and the start and stop dates are populated, the numbers are calculated on the fly for that project. So that's kind of handy. All right, the last thing on the core menu are vendors. And this is a replacement for Classics Vend Screen or USAS Web Vendor option. So let's take a look at one. You see the view, edit, delete. Um, I'll open one up. So here's the vendor number. You don't need to assign if you leave this, like if I'm creating one. Let's, let's enter one. Create. If I leave this blank, it'll auto assign according to the configuration that I've set up. So I'm going to leave it blank so it auto populates. Um, also, you don't need a uh, memo vendor is no longer needed in redesign. The there is no such thing as a memo vendor in uh, redesign. It's just um, you can. Vendor is not required during the requisition processing. So you can leave the vendor blank as opposed to setting up a multi-vendor. So that might be, we're gonna set up, oops. this is the active or inactive flag. This just would be like Pat's books account number. It's a user defined. The default payment type controls the type of the vendor, whether it's check or electronic. Sometimes the email address too populates from the classic import. These gray totals are calculating figures and will update automatically as payments are processed. I can't enter anything there. This section is the 1099 section. Um, this flag would tell it to ignore like that $600 limit or whatever the limit would be. Whether the vendor uses a, a social security or EIN. And then the type, whether it's non-employee, royalty, or gross proceeds for attorneys. This section is the new hire, reportable or non-reportable. And if it's reportable, you would fill in the ID, um, the birth date, possibly the months of the contract. And then down below, you have your standard custom fields the payee for USPS if it's integrated, like for some of those payroll um, transactions. The, the, this pay ID allows the user to link the payee ID from USPS pending transaction to the USAS vendor. So if, however, if the pending transaction doesn't contain a payee ID, a vendor, from the USAT side can still be selected to apply the transaction. And then there is an ACH 
section. I don't have it populated here because I don't have that module turned on. But if it was turned on to be used with another um, system, then the, six, the section of ACH would be added to the vendor screen as well. So then down below that you have a section locations. Here is where the user can set up the default PO location, the check location, or the 1099 location. And these can be all different because you have the ability to um, create multiple. So the primary location I'm going to put um, is one address for the purchase order. And I can fill as much information as I want. The check would go to another address. So, and it actually goes to um, a different check name too. So instead of Pat's Books, it's Books Unlimited. And this goes to, gosh, I can't type. This goes to a PO box in Indiana. So then I would check the check box. If I want it to be also be the 1099 file, I could check that or I could add a new one. So I got my vendor set up. It looks like I have too many digits here. And again, here's where the create new vendor comes into play or close. I'm going to close it. Gives me a warning because I uh, zeroed out that line. So enter something in and it saves it and your vendor's created. So you can create it here. You can also import. We have the new ability to um, import vendors using a CSV spreadsheet. Uh, let me show you. In the manual under the vendors. So again, goes by the, the manual. So under vendors, import criteria. And here's the required fields and the setup. It even gives you a template spreadsheet that you can download to your computer, populate the required, the template has the required fields in there. So if you populate this template spreadsheet, you can import it by choosing your file and loading it. So that's been an enhancement. And again, you can click on the vendor for a quick view of the vendor. You can see this one's a non-employee compensation type vendor with a check. And then you can see that we have had no totals for the fiscal year or year to date. As well as the advanced query. Okay. Any questions? That's everything you wanted to know about the home screen and the core menu. Now we're going to go to the transaction menu. Now the transaction menu is, I believe all of these are alphabetical. So you can see they're alphabetical um, A down to transfers and advances. Instead of going like I did one by one on the core menu, I'm going to go in the order of um, the expenditure process, starting with the requisition. Because the requisition starts the purchase order process. So I under transaction requisitions, I'm on the requisition grid. It looks familiar, has the same icons. 
except for this one now has a print. So if I wanted to print this requisition, I would click that box and choose print. I have the ability to do XML or PDF. If I choose PDF, if I have a custom form, it would show right here, but I don't. So it's just gonna be the default. I'll just show you what it looks like. It looks like a regular requisition. This is the PDF form. You can also convert. You can see that this has already been converted by the purchase order number or this converted column, which here's a tip. If you're getting ready to convert or the user is getting ready to convert, you can put converted false and show all your false requisitions that are waiting to be converted. So looking at the screen, you can see this is um, what we call a non-specific vendor requisition. So instead of having multi-vendors, we have in redesign non-specific. It's not specified until um, later in the process. When you create a requisition, you leave that um, empty, it'll auto-assign. Requisition prefixes can also be used. Um, when the users are entering the information, they only have access to the accounts that they have access to. So whether it's the, um, like if they have a filter on them, only allowing them to see cafeteria funds 006, then they're only gonna see 006 funds in the drop down because that's attached to the user and they won't have access to any other accounts. Um, the audit report does track the process of the requisition to the purchase order. So that's um, tracked. And then we also have a new ability to add attachments to requisitions. So say you have a quote um, that you wanna attach. I'm a high school secretary. I'm sending in a requisition to request um, something and I have a quote. So if I, did I select it? I did. So once I, I could either drop it or select it, I selected it. And now it's attached to the requisition. I can download it. I believe this is just a blank quote that opened on the other screen. So I can attach the quote so that whoever is looking at the requisition to approve, they have all pieces together. Even after this is converted to a purchase order. This attachment can be accept, uh, accessed, but right now it's only accessed with the, by going to the requisition. Right now it's not carried over to the purchase order. So if, you, if a purchase order has a requisition that had an attachment, you can find it under the requisition grid. And I believe there might be an attachment option here. I can't find it, but I'm pretty sure there is. But um, to convert, because again, these are all my unconverted purchase orders. You can select all, you can pick, and you could just do one.
if you leave this blank, um, it'll populate to today's date. The date has to be in an open period. So if you remember from the posting period grid, I can do February through June, I can enter. If I leave the starting purchase order number, it'll auto assign according to the configuration that's set up um, in the system. We'll show that under the configuration menu later on in the week. But let me go back and create that requisition. You can see where the drop down is for the vendors. <clears throat> Here is your delivery addresses. Now remember I had um, two high school, Sample Town, Ohio vendors earlier, and I unactivated the one that had PON. So now I'm not seeing it. I'm only seeing the active delivery addresses. However, if I start typing, and save this, it's gonna, um, it's gonna save that variation. So I would suggest to the users to use the dropdown. And the last one used, like if I had just entered one for Cotton Demo Schools as the delivery address, the next time I go in, it should default to that too. So if I'm the high school secretary, I'm bound to only use that one that's defaulted. You can see that there is a multi-vendor box here that if I leave this blank, once I save it, it's gonna be checkmarked as the multi-vendor. You can put attention to here, once this requisition is converted, the system will, when you open up this requisition, you'll see that it is, um, check mark that it was converted. You can also create a template and a template is a um, requisition intended to remain on the system like for future use. And when I go to add items, This will add another item. And again, those tool tips will help you too. I can delete this item. Let's say if it's incorrect, I just want to start over. Let me put this other item in. I don't, I'm not putting in the right account, so ignore that. Just for demo purposes, you see this button where if I want the book line above the computer, I can just hit that and it moves up. Um, I can add an item by clicking that in between those. And again, if I don't want it, I can delete it with confirmation. Uh, and I can copy this line. So now I have two book lines, but this one is with a different title, different title. You know, like if I'm ordering a whole bunch of books, this is science, this is math, for instance. Um, and you can enter a line without an account number to, be, to later populate it um, prior to disbursement. So right now, without the FY23 budget, secretaries could start entering the requisitions possibly without that account number, like for a head start. So just to show you that that works, no vendor, no account number. Um, and I'm gonna sign, 
uh, save it. It does say, so you see it has no vendor number. I'm gonna edit it so it makes it darker. And it did save without an account number. You can also split items by um, purchase order, or you can split a line item either by price or quantity. So if I enter one, it's going to be a batch of copiers. And I have 10 of them. Sorry. I have one batch of copiers for $100. I want to split that $100 to different accounts. So, again, these tool tips split by quantity, split by price. I'm going to split the quantity of um, 10 copiers at a thousand bucks each to different, basically different departments, different accounts. So I'm going to pick, oh shoot, forgot to hit that split by quantity, which is that little link. I'm going to do eight copiers to the food service. Add another line, do one copier to um, athletics and another copier charge to oh one fun. So you can see I have a quantity of 10 each unit and it totals up to the amount that I entered over here. I accept it. And you can see the three accounts that I applied. So that's splitting by the quant, that's splitting the quantity to different accounts. You can also split, um, split by price. So the quantity must be one. It will be the different icon split by price. And once you put in the price, that icon came alive, it got darker. And then you can, wow, I had a lot of, okay. So cafeteria, I'm gonna split the unit price in half. So this one I split the 10 by different, this one I split the price into two accounts. So that's possible. Um, it's also the same kind of idea on the purchase order as well. When I clicked save, I'm back at the grid. If I put false, I can see my test rec is right there. If I wanted to convert it um, or print it, if I wanted to print it, I have the XML option or PDF. If I choose PDF and I have a custom form, it would show right there but I don't in this requisition, I believe I showed you before. And this is the split um, quantity and price lines. Okay. 
All right. All right, so the, when you do convert this date that you can either enter or choose must be in an open period. Because again, the book has to be open to make a transaction, write a transaction on the books. And then if you leave the starting PO number blank, it'll auto populate. Um, it will give you the conversion results errors. And this shows what errors I have, and it shows in red. You can go back and correct it. The requisition has at least one item that doesn't have an account specifies. So you can update that. So after your requisitions are entered, um, the next step in the process would be purchase orders. And again, you can convert it here, but by going to the purchase order grid, you can see the ones that are converted with the created, whether they're invoiceable or not, as well as other columns that you can pull in, like maybe the remaining encumbrance. Um, we do have a new icon on this grid, which is the invoicing icon, which is the next step, which we'll cover. But keep in mind that this icon you can do here or through the menu option. You can print the um, purchase order by clicking and Click on that icon, you can view it, edit, or delete if um, you can only delete if there's no transactions against it or it hasn't been modified. So now, let's see, I am going to pull up. purchase order for Jackson signs and view it. You can see that it's very similar to your requisition screen. It just has the purchase order number in it and um, the totals populated. You can see this date at the top, which is the date that it was converted or entered. This must be in the current or an open posting period when it's converted. You have the vendor and then you have a delivery date. You also have a created date. You created this and the, the system will track this. It was at when it was actually entered. You have a modified date. Once this is modified, um, you can't, well, it'll show you the modified date. And then the posted date right here. So this is set with third-party applications and this field will automatically populates to the created date for the new purchase orders and then update to the modified date if the PO is um, modified. We also have a source field. This is the requisition number and whether or not this purchase order is invoiceable. So you can see here that it is because there are um, 5,000 remaining encumbrance and nothing paid. So that check mark zero and also on the grid where it says true. If let me go back to that. There is a then and now check mark too. So that will be automatically checked when um, the user receives the warning when the invoicing 
it'll flag the purchase order that it was a then and now purchase order when the invoicing uses a date prior to the purchase order date. All right, so editing, amend, and repair. Edit a purchase order. You would want to do an edit when the PO has not been sent to the vendor. So for example, this PO, um, I just entered, we'll pretend I just entered it. And it, instead of Jackson signs, I should have put Jackson um, team or something. I can go in right away and um, edit it. These, these would only be, the edit is only applicable to new purchase orders that are in the open and current period and only fields that are allowed to be edited will show to be edited. Now, if you amend a purchase order, amend is when, um, you, when the PO has been already sent to the vendor. So a purchase order that was sent last month in February. You're not allowed, you, you're not permitted to change the vendor because it's already been submitted. If the PO has already been invoiced or paid, you won't be able to amend the, um, like the name of the vendor or if it's in a closed period. So if I look at This PO back in October 2020, you can see I don't even have either of those abilities because October 2020 is in a closed period and it's been paid on. Um, looking at This purchase order, this purchase order is from February. You can see this date. Um, shoot. This other icon, edit, will bring up your amend, edit, or cancel. I go to ed, amend this because it's a February purchase order and I can't um, edit it because it's already been sent. This is amending where you can see you can't change the vendor. You can change the delivery option and you can possibly um, update the items but you would need to copy the item to add to it. So instead of the calendars being 540, we're gonna say there was a huge price increase for $700. Then what you would do is cancel this item. You can see that the tooltip says cancel this item and it'll ask you for the date, which is today. And again, that must be in an open period. So now I, I amended this purchase order by correcting this line and canceling it and adding a new one by copying it with this other icon. So in classic, you had the verify invoice program and reflections where you could um, like repair a purchase order, per, the purchase order date, the vendor or the PO item code. So as long as the PO or the PO charge doesn't have any payments or disbursements posted against it, you can use this um, repair option by viewing the PO. And you see that 
repair button that says change accounts on unpaid charges. I click that. I have three tabs up here. I can change the account from to two. I can change the vendor to a different vendor or I can change the date. And again, I can move this box to see what it's orig uh, originally dated. So instead of 214, let's say 228 instead. I enter the new date, click update, and then I get an error because of a rule. But if we, if that's how it would work. Let me pull up a one that I entered. Repair. It's a March. We're going to go from the current account to. I want that selected and I hit update. And this account changed from an object of 851 to 841. You also have the option of printing the repair result. You wanted to keep that for your record. Nothing fancy, kind of like what was on the screen. But now your purchase order account is closed or updated, sorry. All right, so like I said, there's an invoice option on the screen with that icon. That is the next step in the process is invoicing that purchase order. So you can hit that icon and come up to this AP invoice, which I believe looks similar to the USAS web. Or let's go to the transaction menu and select AP invoices. Um, the only advantage to go using the PO screen and then the little icon is you're going to get direct, you're going to be taken right into the invoice screen. So we want to sort the grid to be only invoiceable purchase orders. So like this Jackson signs, actually we'll do portals of software. 218. So that comes up to the screen, but if I went to transaction AP invoices, which I'm sitting here, I would have to hit create and know the purchase order number. I would still be taking, be taken to the same screen. So again, this date is, um, This will default to the current date. If you want to enter a date from the physical invoice, you can, as long as that posting period is open. Let's say we just received a January invoice and January month is closed. So I can't enter the January date here because it's not going to let me create a transaction in a closed month the posting period has to be open. So in that case, I'll use the today date so it gets posted to March, but the vendor invoice date, I can enter the actual date that the invoice says we just, the postman was late and we just received the January invoice. So then I see that I have this line paid already, but if I click on it, fill it, 
it goes to full. I can change it to partial. I can select whatever I want to pay for the invoice. Here's your receive date. We do have the ability to um, integrate the EIS, which is the equipment inventory um, system. So the, that's interactive. And then click save and you have your invoice. I pull up one that was ready. Um, Oh, I thought this PO would have multiple lines, but um, if there's multiple lines, there's usually a check mark up here that you click on and it'll uh, check mark all the items if you want to fill all items. But say you have this purchase order that, or this invoice that is partial. Let's first pull up the, um, here's the scenario. This invoice, we invoiced and set as partial. I got word from the manufacturer that we won't be getting the rest of the shipment. So I want to change this. Instead of entering an AP invoice of cancel, I can go in here, pull it up, and change this to full status by clicking on here. So you can see by hovering, it says change status from partial to full. So if I did that, you see it changed to full. So once this AP invoice is paid, the purchase order is gonna have no remaining encumbrance. I wanna change it back to partial. Again, the tooltip says full to partial, I can do so. Now I mentioned a then and now report and how you would get that to know uh, what purchase orders are, should be included in then and, then and now report. You can add this column under the PO grid. So I'm navigating to transaction purchase order. And then under the more button, once this blue bar is caught up with me, you can pull in the then and now column to your grid and then select, uh-oh. We'll give this a moment while the system connects. There we go. I'm on the purchase order grid. Under the more button, there's a then and now. If I click it, it'll be added to my grid. And it's a true or false. So is it a then and now true? I put T for true. These are the purchase orders like this one. That is a then and now. And then you can process a report if you choose to. So after you invoice, once you invoice, you know, in the classic, you had the invoice list. Our invoice list is under transaction payables. So any invoice, any invoice ready to be assigned a check number and post the disbursement will be sitting under the payables. And in payables, you have two tabs, vendor and detail tab. Um, the vendor will, the, the vendor tab works like check proc worked. It's a total by the vendor. So if you had 10 different invoices for Nichols Bakery, it'll be Nichols Bakery with the total. Something's going on with the system. The detail tab, which I'm navigating to, will allow the districts to see all invoices per the vendor. So it's going to list all those 10 nickel bakery invoices and show each one. 
And then the user can select each invoice that they want to actually print. And then we would go to the disbursement tab. All right, so if this bakery had 10, I don't know if it does, it would just show the total of 10 here. On the detail tab, again, I can sort these grids by the amount. I see I have two for the bakery. So there's split out detail and they're totaled by the vendor. So at this point, I can select all and post, or I can just do one. Once I post selected, it'll pop up here. I have one invoice for the total. This is where your bank accounts are gonna show. So what? remember we set up the two bank accounts under core bank accounts. And it's going to default to the one that was marked default. But you also have the option to choose the other one. You click post. You can either go back to the grid or continue to print. If you hit continue to print, it takes you to the disbursement grid. And you can see the Covington Bakery is sitting there without a check number. So at that point, you can generate the print file. Let that default to whatever setup in the configuration. PDF. Here's an example of if I choose PDF and I have a custom form, I can choose that or I can go with the default form. And I just added a logo to this but it can be customized however the district wants to customize it. But just to show you an example. So now it has the check number one assigned to the disbursement. Now we were sitting under payables and there's still more payables there. Um, I'm sorry. Let me go back to the disbursement grid. I was looking for this button, show printable. So anyone, any checks like before where this one didn't have a check number, you can click this to show the printable. So here, since I kind of jumped ahead, we'll go back to the payable, select the other Covington, post it. It's no longer on the payables, but it will be on the disbursements. And since I selected a whole bunch, we're just going to pretend I selected like a pile of payables to print. So that's when you would go here and see all the checks that are ready to print. And then you can like select them all either by populating them all or by selecting. So then on this disbursement grid, once you um, are sent here, you also have generate the print file, reconcile, unreconcile, void, and resequence. Um, I showed you the print file. You can reconcile this check by clicking that reconcile, and then it would be no longer outstanding in the status column. You can also unreconcile if it's been. Um, there's more setup required for this auto reconcile, but it's, um, you upload the bank file here to reconcile like a batch of checks that you get from the bank. And we'll go, we'll discuss that more on utilities on day three.
And you can um, void a check. So let's void. I'm going to avoid this Lawrenceville. So I select that one. That's the one I want to avoid. Click void. This pops up. Now, def by default, this checkbox is marked to void the invoice items. This is, um, when this is selected, it'll cancel the associated invoices similar to classic. If you uncheck it and then click confirm, you'll avoid the disbursement, but, um, but you wanna keep the invoice so that you can modify it, correct it, and process it again. So an example would be uh, where you would not void this would be, if the invoice amount was wrong. So I entered it at 450, but it should have been 700. So I wanna avoid it. I still want that invoice out there because I can modify it and confirm. That check is gonna be avoided. You get the pop-up with the result. You can see it changed here on the grid void with the date. And now if I go back to my payables, you can see that's sitting out there for 450. But it still says 450. So you would have to go over to the AP invoices, modify that. Edit. Save it. And then when you go to the payables, now it says 700. And now you can post the correct one. So at check marks, um, confusing. There are in the documentation, uh, like a tool tip that says what that means, what that checkbox means. So by unchecking it, the invoice will go back to payables for modification and to be reposted. By voiding it, it cancels it all. It cancels the disbursement and the invoice. So you would have to re-enter the invoice if needed. You can also resequence. Sometimes the users need to resequence um, check numbers like you did in Classic with um, check sequence. This allows the user to change the check numbers that are incorrectly posted or change the check numbers and void old checks. So for example, I have this set up as one or the check number one. If I want it to be in line with those other checks, I can resequence the checks if needed. All right, so activity ledger. This is like EIEIO in reflections or USAS Web's query. And I love this screen because you not only can bring in POs, invoices, checks, receipts, refunds, but you have all these other options like that is in relation to the refund or the check numbers. So for instance, oh, and then we have one more new button, I guess on this grid, which is this. This limits the grid results. Um, and if you want to increase it, you would move it. I have honestly never used that but because there's so many sorting abilities that you could um, 
narrow down that I've never actually used that. All right, so, so we're on the activity ledger and what if I want all um, transaction between dates? So in the date field, I could actually put in 01, 2019, period, period. So I did the whole month of um, July, 2019. So I can see all my data on this one screen. I can then further um, filter down to just purchase orders for July or disbursements. And you notice I'm just putting B for disbursement. I can sort by what's outstanding, enter true, what's invoiceable, and so forth. So this is a, a great sorting tool. I am going to pull up the purchase order. So just on this purchase order, I can see all the invoices, all the disbursements and the purchase order and the status because I pulled that into the grid. So this can be very helpful. Another item on this uh, transaction menu is receipts. And again, you can create um, print, you can view, by viewing, you can edit, you can clone this receipt. Um, you don't, you can leave that blank so it auto populates. You can put a description receipt on prom or whatever. Oh, this little magnifying glass. Oh, and you, okay. So the icons delete, add an item, copy an item, and move up and down. So if I general postage, I can move that up to the first line as well. That's the copy one. This is the move up, move down. You can have receipt transaction. You can have um, reduction of expenditures. Here is the account search, the little magnifying glass, which brings this up. And again, there's searching features here too. So if I put in um, percentage with student, I will get all my student accounts. That has the word student in it. You can also pull it up by XREF, which I don't think I have any set up, sorry. And as I start to populate this, I was trying to find one with that. It further narrows it down by adding more information. Your created date is stored and the date of the receipt is also stored. So the print button in print, you can customize that form if you choose to, otherwise it'll look like a regular receipt. Sometimes people put a logo on it or something. You can also import receipts. Kind of the same way by going to the documentation under receipts and to get that criteria, which I did forget to mention under AP invoices, you also can do that. 
there's a button there. And under the AP invoices, there's the AP invoice criteria. criteria. Similarly, a receipt import, a receipt import criteria, along with this template spreadsheet. And refunds. So you can create a refund with or without a check. You can clone a refund. Let's look at one. You can use the create button. You can view it. And once it opens, you can see where you can edit it. You can edit it here or once it opens. Looks like the system's ready for lunch. That little, oh, there we go, good. So once you view it, I clicked on this icon and it opened up to this. You have the ability to edit it or clone it. So say, I don't know, I just wanted to add more description or something, I don't know, and save it again. Since it's a July purchase order and that month is closed, I can't post any transactions to a closed month. So that's why I'm getting that error. Looks like I don't have a current one. But let's, I mean, you could create one. That will auto populate the date refunded to PAC, description, student fees. This will populate once um, it gets processed. If I want to check, I would check mark that. Again, we can make a refund with or without a check. So I'm going to do it with a check. Again, the default bank account will default to be the default, or you can choose the vendor and then the items. I'm just going to pick any account. If I don't click that, this box will stay and I'll be forced to X out of this because I didn't choose close before saving. Then X out. You see, I have a typo. I'm supposed to say student fees. This is making it go kind of slow. Okay. So again, you can print it with or without the default form. Is that the one I? That's the refund. And since I said it was um, that I wanted a check, it's going to be sitting in the disbursements without a check. Marked as a refund for 10 bucks without a check. So to sign in a check, I would simply check mark it and print the file. Um, you can reverse a refund. So to reverse a refund that also created a check like this one, you would check mark it. Um, and mark void. So I'm voiding the disbursement. 
but this will also um, reverse the refund and the revenue account history. So then if we go back to the refund page, the bait and insurance refund um, is marked void true. Now say you have a refund like this without a check, what you would do is um, to reverse a refund that did not create a check, you would delete the refund from the refund grid using the delete icon. But again, it's gotta be in an open period. And I so if I say yes, it's gonna give me an error. I don't have an example of that, but. All right. Transfers and advances. This is like classics account mod um, in reflections. And it does not, uh, the difference between classic and redesign is it does not require a vendor. It does not require a PO or a check. That's the nice thing. But to create a transfer, you would create, hit the button create. This pops up. You can choose transfer or advance. I'm going to transfer $5,000 to cafeteria. And only the amounts that are available will show. So I'm going to transfer it from 001 to 006 and click Save. I, I, this time I left it Create New, so it came up with a, uh, a new empty pop-up. I'm going to create an advance this time and say that I'm advancing uh, 10,000 to um, the principal account. And again, only accounts that will show will populate. You can use that um, magnifying glass here as well. I guess I didn't have the 018 stack. But anyway, that's what you would do to set up an advance. How you repay an advance, you would view. So this one's an advance. And you view it, and you see down here, there's a check mark. And if you hover, it says you would create a repayment. So by clicking that, you can enter that out of $10,000 on 315, I repaid 2,000 of it. And then it is saved under there. So until that's all um, paid off, you would continue to track it. So that's saved under there, under fun to fun. And if you processed a lot of those that day under the report manager, there is a report that is called um, 
transfer events activity that you could run or T for today and get all the ones that you processed. Okay, we got two more topics under the transaction menu, whereas uh, one of them is the pending transaction. These are like, the pending transaction is like the classic auto post option. It will contain the transaction sitting out there from different systems. So like payroll, which is this, file right here, or like the board distribution or the board retirement from USPS redesign. So when payroll sends their payroll file over to the USAS, you'll come into here and see that. <clears throat> Again, you can move it and reorganize your grid. You can get a report. I don't think there's many options here, but if you wanted more, you could Put it in there. By clicking on this icon, edit, you now have post, reject, or validate. Post it, you would post these accounts of payroll to the accounts. Rejecting it would send this whole file back to USPS for any in questions. So if we did that, you also have a rejection reason why um, that the treasurer or whoever could put. I don't know what the rejection reason would be, but they reject it. It goes back to USPS. USPS would correct it, send it back to USAS, and we it would be sitting here under pending transaction again. And then you can post or validate. Validate is with the errors. This is just warning, so it'll be good. And then you can post. You can choose electronic or not. You can see where it um, defaults to the transaction date in the file and the bank account that was used. So once you click that, it removes it from the pending file. Excuse me. And you can see now it's here. Our payroll. <clears throat> Distribution and error corrections. These do not require a vendor, a purchase order, a check, but they, the user does have the ability to put this in the description. When creating this, let's look at one. Well, let's create one. This will default auto populate. There's the date, description, transfer, whatever. You could put your description in there. These gray boxes will populate, they're not for us. And then these transactions have to net to zero. So looking at an old one, you can see that the total to zero. And they basically transferred the gifted supplies from one account to another, to the correct. It does give you a distribution number, which you can find on the grid. Um, and it tracks even the legacy purchase order number. When is this used? It can be used when posting like a corrected entry for expenditure charge to the wrong account. Um, in cases where you don't need to void the check, you just need to uh, update the account that it was charged to. 
So in that case, if you're correcting expenditure accounts, um, excuse me, you would enter a positive amount for the reduction expenditure or the incorrect amount and enter a negative amount for the negative reduction of expenditure to correct that account. And um, kind of opposite for the revenue accounts. When you're transferring it, you'll enter a negative amount for the incorrect amount and a positive amount for the correct amount. So positive because it's revenue going into the account to the correct account. Um, I believe that is all I have. I did recall that I forgot to show you. I had a custom purchase order form customized. So I'm gonna show you that. Again, you have the ability to import purchase orders too. When I go to print a purchase order, remember I said you could default, use the default form or the PO form. I don't think I showed you this, even though I had a default form set up. So I wanted to make sure I just put in the logo. So there is capability in this software to not only customize the user, you can customize your grids, you can customize forms, um, forms like purchase orders, checks, um, refund receipts. Um, I want to make sure I showed you that. I know we went through a lot. Is there any questions that I can help clarify or anything regarding the home menu, the core menu, or the transaction menu? Tomorrow, we'll be going over the budgeting. So if I'm looking at this, sorry. Tomorrow, We'll be going through the budgeting, the periodic. Where is my PowerPoint? I just closed the PowerPoint by accident. But tomorrow, join us for some more menu options. Amanda will be covering that. And then Friday, we'll be doing the reports and utility menu options. If there are no other questions, I thank you sincerely for joining us. and. Share the recording with your coworkers. Have a great day and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Pat. Thank you.